All right, folks, so this is the new Polar Vantage V3, the very long-awaited update to Polar's high-end Vantage series line of multi-sport watches. And when I mean long time, I mean it's been over three years since Polar came out with their Vantage V2. So what's new with the Vantage V3? Well, first off, there's now a super bright AMOLED display, which goes along with the trend of many other recent sport watches. They've also added a dual frequency satellite chipset for increased GPS accuracy. They've updated the heart rate sensor with a new fourth generation sensor. And another huge update is that now has offline Topo maps. And basically, the Vantage V3 is helping bring Polar back in the game amongst a very competitive landscape of sport watches from the likes of Garmin, Chorus, and Sunto. But at a price of $599, it really needs to deliver when you're talking about other watches at similar prices like the Foreigner 965 from Garmin, and even the more aggressively priced Sunto Race, as well as the Chorus Apex 2 Pro. And in today's video, we're going to find out if it can compete. So I've been testing the Vantage V3 for a couple weeks now, and I've got tons of detail for you in this video for how this watch actually performs in regards to the health features, the training features, feedback, the recovery feedback, and of course real world examples when it comes to the new offline maps, GPS accuracy, as well as heart rate accuracy. And if you do happen to find the information in this video useful, do me a favor and just quickly hit that like button down below. It's a small little thing that'll do that'll help this video and the channel out quite a bit and I appreciate it. Okay, so first up, let's talk about the hardware. So the Vantage V3 is made out of aluminum and it shares very similar design cues from the Vantage V2 where it has a nice smooth puck-like shape to it. The big difference now is that the Vantage V3 has more standard lugs which work with industry standard bands versus the V2 which has an integrated band design. You could actually use standard bands with the V2 but that required those little shift band adapter thingies but thankfully you don't need those anymore. The case is also just ever so slightly larger at 47 millimeters wide, but it's actually a little bit thinner if you include the heart rate sensor. The heart rate sensor on the V2 stuck out a little bit with this little bump, but the new fourth generation sensor on the V3 is nearly flush with the case. And don't worry, we're definitely gonna talk about this new heart rate sensor in just a bit and if it actually delivers on accuracy. And you're gonna to wanna to stick around for that section of the video. So getting back to the front of the Vantage V3 though, here's one of the biggest updates from the V2 and that's a brand new AMOLED display and they really hit it out of the park with this display. So it's a 1.39 inch touchscreen display with 462 by 462 pixels and colors pop, there's tons of contrast and looks great both indoors as well as outdoors where it has a max brightness of over 1000 nits. And another thing I think they really did well here is that if you look at it from an off angle, there's basically like no gap at all from the top of the glass to the display itself. It it looks like things are just painted right on the surface, so they did a really good job here. It also gets crazy bright outside where you can see that it kind of switches to this extra, extra bright mode. There's seriously no issues with this at all when it comes to seeing it outside. So the worries of an AMOLED display on a sports watch, I think are kind of things of the past at this point. The display itself is protected by Gorilla Glass 3 and it does also have curves at the edges. So it may be more susceptible to scratches not only due to the curves, but also because it doesn't have a sapphire lens. Oh, and the Vantage V3 has a 50 meter water resistance rating. And to get around the device, this is gonna be the same as the Vantage V2 where it uses a five button configuration along with a touchscreen. But one big change here is that the interface is now super fast now in nearly all areas of the interface. And there's not that lag that was present on the V2. They claim that the CPU is now 129% faster and that certainly seems to be the case. The interface itself though, well, it's pretty similar to pretty much all Vantage series watches of the past. It looks way, way better of course, just because of that new display, but it just feels a little bit dated at this point and and I think it could use a bit of a refresh. And then when it comes to smartwatch related features, the V3 can receive notifications for texts, calls, as well as app notifications. And you can choose to have these appear on three different levels. So just during normal use as a smartwatch, just during training or always on all the time. And you can also disable them all together if you want, but there isn't necessarily an option to customize what kind of notifications that you want to receive. Like for instance, just text or calls, but maybe not app notifications, which is what I usually prefer. And then you can also view weather information as well as sunrise and sunset times that are synced from your phone. And then it also does have music controls where it can control the music playing on your phone if your phone is in range, but it doesn't have any onboard music storage and playback capabilities. And then another nice addition to the V3 is that it also has a flashlight mode for the display and you can access this just by swiping down to access the control menu where you have both an airplane mode as well as a flashlight mode and a few other functions. And then when it comes to battery life, the V3 gets some pretty respectable battery life for a watch that has an AMOLED display where it can get up to five days or so if you're using it as a smartwatch, if you're using the always on display, and then around eight days or so if you turn off the always on display. And then for outdoor activity tracking, they claim anywhere from 43 hours in some of the highest accuracy settings, all the way up to 140 hours in some of the power saving modes. 
However, I wasn't necessarily getting up to that 43 hour mark with the highest accuracy modes where I was usually getting around the range of like 32 to 34 hours or so. Still respectable, but not necessarily 43 hours. But the good news is that I'm definitely getting around that five day mark when it comes to using it just as a smartwatch. And actually that does also include some outdoor activity tracking in there. So I think that holds true. And then when it comes to the health features and all the sensors that it has for that, so it has a heart rate sensor, it has an SpO2 sensor for tracking blood oxygen saturation levels, it has a skin temperature sensor that's used during sleep, and then there's also wrist ECG. And the heart rate sensor is their latest fourth generation sensor, which is supposed to be more accurate than their previous generations. And we'll go over the accuracy of that when we go over the sports and fitness performance. But when it comes to the SpO2 sensor, that seems to line up with a medical grade fingertip sensor that I have. And then it also does have wrist ECG. Now with its wrist ECG feature though, one important thing to note here is that at the moment, this is not a medically certified ECG like what you find on likes of a Garmin or an Apple Watch. It's basically just collecting information that you can then have a medical and professional analyze to see if anything is actually going on. So it's not going to say if anything is abnormal and it's not going to provide any AFib detection. So there is going to be a difference with Polar's implementation here versus some other brands. And then when it comes to training feedback as well as training guidance, well, this is largely going to be the same as what's been found before, but that is to say that it does offer some useful features here. So for training feedback, it has their cardio load status feature, which gives you an idea of how your current training load compares to previous training, which can help in making sure that you're staying consistent consistent with your training load, but also make sure that you're not overtraining or undertraining. And this is all based on heart rate from workouts. So if I were to suddenly increase my training load, it would likely indicate that I'm overreaching since that would be too drastic an increase based on my long-term training history. And same thing goes in the other direction where if I suddenly decrease my training load, that means I could be detraining. And then when it comes to training guidance, the Vantage V3 has their Fit Spark feature. So what this does is that it suggests different kinds of workouts based on previous training that could benefit you the most at a given point in time, like strength work, cardio, or supportive training. So like here, it's suggesting that I do some supportive work to complement the cardio that I've already done, like core exercises, mobility work, or some functional training. And I do find that these are generally in line with what I may need to be doing to supplement my normal training. And what's nice about these suggestions too is that you don't have to have a specific training plan or anything like that. These are just suggestions based on your training history. And then for recovery feedback, Polar has their nightly recharge feature, which is comprised of two different metrics, your ANS charge as well as your sleep charge. So with sleep charge, this is more about the quality of your sleep, including your sleep duration, sleep continuity, any interruptions you had during the night, as well as time spent in different sleep cycles. And then your ANS charge is more on the recovery side of things based on your autonomic nervous system. And this can be a good indicator of how well your body is responding to training and if you're recovering well. And this is based on heart rate, heart rate variability, as well as breathing rate. And I find that with the nightly recharge feature, this is almost always an accurate reflection of how I actually feel. Like if I get some solid sleep, I get a good sleep charge score. And the same thing goes for ANS charge where let's say I've been overtraining or maybe had some alcohol the night before, I'll likely not see a good ANS charge. But if I'm training optimally and being more healthy, I'll see that number go up. But I think what I probably like most about that nightly recharge feature is that it is just kind of an easy to understand metric. And if you want to dive in deeper into all the details, you certainly can. The Vantage V3 also has their new sleep boost feature, which is basically a forecast of how recent sleep is expected to boost you throughout the day, like to the hour sort of thing, where it's trying to predict when you'll have the most energy in a given day. So for me, I almost always feel the most energized around noon to 1 p.m. or so, which is usually when I try to get in my cardio workout, and then I'll start fading a little bit more around 4 p.m. And then after that, I'll usually go to the gym in the evenings for some weight training, where I'm typically arriving a little bit groggy, but then after getting into it and warming up, I'm pretty energized just due to the endorphins. But as you can tell, the sleep boost feature isn't necessarily in line with how I usually feel throughout the day. In fact, it's almost the opposite where I actually feel it's indicating a dip in the middle of the day where that's when I'm actually feeling the most energized. So I'm not super sold on that feature. And then it also does have a skin temperature sensor where after three nights of sleeping with it, it can then provide a baseline and any difference in that baseline from night to night. And then when it comes to sport profiles, Polar has a ton to choose from, like nearly anything that you can think of. And these include the typical stuff like running, cycling, and swimming for both outdoors as well as indoors, full triathlon support, outdoor recreation profiles like skiing. The list kind of goes on and on. But one thing to note though is that you will use the app to manage the sport profile. So you can't actually add or delete activity profiles from the watch itself. But one of the biggest new additions with Advantage V3 when it comes to sports and outdoor usage though are offline topo maps. And there's basically two different flavors of what kind of maps you can have on the watch. So when you get the watch, you should have their basic maps for both North America as well as Europe pre-installed. And these are basically map images that show stuff like roads, trails, bodies of water, and even some labels of some towns. 
But if you want more detail than that, you can actually download their more detailed maps. And these add additional information like topographic contour lines and actual labels for some of the finer details like rivers and streams, as well as some trails. And then you'll do all the map downloading on your computer via the Polar Flow website, where you can choose different regions you want to download, as well as if you want the basic or more detailed maps for those regions. And all the maps are free, by the way. And then all you do to get them on your watch is you just plug your watch into your computer and drag and drop those files over. Now, although you can't download maps to your watch via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, downloading maps over the air can take a long, long time, especially when you're talking about file sizes this large. So doing it through your computer is going to be the faster method. But I would have just kind of preferred to have maybe both both options in the case where I maybe didn't have a computer nearby. Oh, and then when it comes to storage for all those maps, the Vantage V3 has 32 gigabytes of storage and you should be able to load up multiple regions of detailed maps on the watch at one time. So next up, let's talk about navigation with those maps. And this is one area where I hope this will change over time with updates because right now at the time of this filming, I don't think it's necessarily where it needs to be. So first off, if you're not using a predefined route and you're just recording an outdoor activity like normal, what happens here is that you can see the map during your activity, but notice that it doesn't have a breadcrumb trail on the map showing your historical route which is different than basically any other watch that has navigation capabilities. What you can do, however, is enable their back to start routing function, which then shows your historical route, which you can use to get back to your start location, or you can route using a beeline. Now, if you do load in a predetermined route though, then you'll get a breadcrumb route of where you've been, which is shown in red, along with the intended route that's shown in blue. And then you can also get turn by turn notifications if you build your route with Komoot. Right now, there's no Strava route integration though, so that would be kind of nice to see in the future, although it does have Strava live segments. And then I noticed another little quirk on this hike. So the red portion shows the track of where I've been, and then the blue portion shows my planned route, like I was mentioning earlier. And that was fine here, and then here, and then also here. But then suddenly it kind of flipped it around for some reason. I actually hadn't gone to the left yet on that loop, but somehow it turned red. So that was just kind of strange. One big difference with the mapping on the Vantage V3 versus something like a Garmin is that it doesn't have on-demand routing. Like you can't put in a location on a map or choose a specific location and have it properly route to that location with turn-by-turn -turn directions because the maps that it has on board are just more map images that do help provide context of your location, but they are just images. So they don't have the actual information built into them to allow for on-demand navigation other than saying, let's say, go that direction. And then when it comes to actual GPS accuracy, the Vantage V3 now comes with a new dual band or dual frequency satellite chipset. Again, another thing that brings the Vantage V3 more in line with other sports watches on the marketplace. And the aim with this kind of technology is to deliver higher accuracy in challenging environments, such as really tall buildings, heavy tree cover, tall canyon walls, basically anything that could kind of get in the way of getting a clear view of the sky where satellite signals can actually bounce off of those objects. Now, just because a watch does have one of these chipsets though, doesn't necessarily make it automatically better. There's other factors like antenna design that play a role in accuracy. So like on this right here, all good stuff out of the Vantage V3 where the total distance lined up nearly perfectly with the other test devices that use similar technology. Really good in fact. And then when it comes to elevation gain, pretty close here as well. But then on this right here, it came up a little bit short compared to the other devices. And in taking a look at the GPS tracks, there were no huge misses or anything like that. It looks good from a high level, but if we zoom in on some of these corners and curves, what we can see is that on some of these, it just wasn't quite as spot on to the actual trail that I was riding. So if we basically just start to add up all these curves and corners where it wasn't quite as accurate, that could lead to that almost half mile difference. And then for another example, here's a hike that I did, and this was pretty close for the most part when it comes to the total distance, and the GPS tracks also looked pretty good as well. Maybe just this one corner here was a little bit off, but overall, this was just fine. But then here's a mountain bike ride that I did, and this was farther off than the other examples, and I think what it's coming down to is that although there weren't ever any huge misses with enough tight corners and curves, that can all add up in a loss of distance. So like on activities that were out in the wide open, like that road ride that didn't have many tight corners and curves, it did well. And also did well on that hike at slower speeds. But what it seems like is that for activities that involve higher speeds as well as tighter turns, basically it kind of overshoots a lot of those, which can lead to a difference in total distance. And to wrap things up, let's talk about heart rate accuracy. So the Vantage V3 has their newest fourth generation sensor that they claim is 25% more accurate than before. Now, Polar is widely known for producing some of the most accurate external heart rate monitors out there, including the H10 chest heart rate strap, as well as their Verity Sense optical heart rate monitor. And I use both of those quite a bit as reliable references for lots of my tests. But the accuracy from their external sensors hasn't necessarily translated to their watches over the years where I haven't necessarily gotten the same kind of results out of previous watches. So I guess let's take a look at this newest sensor to see if it's improved. 
So starting out with some indoor cycling, this is basically what I usually do to get a baseline on how a sensor will perform, where I generally get pretty good results out of most sensors just because it's a very controlled environment where there's very few variables for a watch to have to deal with. So at the beginning of this workout, while all sensors can kind of take a little while to get a lock in, that's what we're seeing out of the Vantage V3 as well as the Sunto race. So we can kind of just call that a wash. But then on this rest period after the warm up, there was this little shakiness from the V3, but after that it handled the first setup interval as well. But then again, right here, there's this kind of rather large dropout as I was starting the next set. But then after that, for the rest of the workout, it did well. And then for this workout here, the overall trends are good, but there's just much more shakiness going on than what I usually see for most watches for indoor cycling. Plus then a few little spikes and drops over here. And then the same thing kind of goes for this workout here, where again, it's just kind of jittery on numerous sections of the ride. But then there was this ride here where it took over 10 minutes to get a lock on my heart rate. So this was just a little bit concerning. All right, so how about running then? So on this run here, it did a pretty good job overall, where on the majority of the run, it was basically in line with the external monitors. A bit of a dip here, but then it got back in line. So pretty good for the most part. And then for this run here, not quite as good as the first example, where there are just more spots where it wandered. Now taking it outside for some road biking, this is where we start to introduce more variables for a heart rate sensor to work with, like vibrations and bumps on the road, and this is generally where you'll start to see less accurate results. For the majority of the ride, it was okay, but then on the tail end of the ride, we start to see that shakiness and a rather large spike right here. And then for a weight training, actually not bad in the whole scheme of things when it comes to this kind of activity where it didn't have any huge spikes or drops, but you can see that right here on these shoulder flies that it didn't do all that well, but it did handle the high intensity intervals at the end. And then I saw similar things on this session here where it did have some issues tracking some of these sets here and here, but it did well tracking the high intensity intervals. But overall, I was expecting a bit more from this new sensor, and I wasn't really a fan of some of that jitteriness, even on some of the easier activities like indoor cycling, and then some of those random dropouts and a few of those large spikes. So to get more accurate heart rate for workouts, you can pair the Vantage V3 to an external heart rate monitor. You can pair it with the power meters, you can pair it with speed and cadence sensors for cycling, as well as foot pods. But just note though that the Vantage V3 only pairs to Bluetooth sensors and can't pair to Ant Plus sensors. And that really shouldn't be a big deal for most folks out there, but one snag with only supporting Bluetooth sensors is some smart bike trainers only have one Bluetooth channel where you could basically either pair your smart trainer to your cycling app or to your watch, but not necessarily both at the same time. So with the Vantage V3, it is great to see Polar get back in the game with something that has comparable features and technology with some of its competitors, but at the same time, it also feels like it was maybe taken out of the oven a bit too early, where some of the features feel a bit underbaked at this point, but hopefully some of those can be resolved with software updates. But I think the bigger issue though is going to be that $600 price tag considering its performance, as well as other watches in that same price range. But those are just my thoughts on the Vantage V3, but I also want to hear from you. So like if you're considering getting one or if you already have one, what do you think? Definitely let us all know down in the comments section down below. And if the information in this video did help you out at all, do me a favor and just quickly hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel for plenty more videos just like this that are coming soon. In the meantime, have fun out there and we will see you in the next video.